This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm here to talk about um, the cl clinical trial that CIRM um, has invested in in HIV and AIDS, which is quite a journey we've taken since I've come onto this board. I do, but, but before I do that, I, I want to uh, uh, note um, Ian Sweetler has just told me that we have uh, signed a uh, MOU, a uh, co funding agreement with the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, which um, is an organization I think, I'm pretty sure, I, treats more patients than anybody else, HIV patients, than anybody else in the world. They run the Magic Johnson clinics. Uh, they really do an amazing uh, job in California and San Francisco and Los Angeles in treating patients. I want to specifically acknowledge Senator Torres, uh, who, who, who brought this partnership in. We don't have a lot of partnership with, with uh, community organizations, community-based organizations. And I want to, you know, Senator Torres making this happen is, is a great thing. There's a huge, uh, diverse clinical population there that's important. And plus, Senator Torres' work in HIV and AIDS, you know, he's here as a colon cancer um, uh, advocate, I think. But really, art has been there for people with HIV and AIDS. Going back to the very beginning when the very first funding for HIV and AIDS was provided anywhere in the country through the California program that he and Diane Feinstein and Willie Brown put together. So we've got three decades of incredible work by Senator Torres. So on behalf of the community, I want to thank Art. Um, I also, just in terms of this, this particular project, I, I noticed we just approved another stem cell, uh, hematopoietic stem cell gene engineering project. We have another one in B thalassemia. This platform is really, I think, becoming uh, a major part of, of CIRM's work in the, in the clinical space. And I think what CIRM has done in advancing this is huge. We, we're also looking at sickle cell, uh, we have a hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy project in, um, in cancer. And so this, I think the whole science team and, and really the leadership has done a tremendous job in advancing this technology. And so this is, we've got two projects in HIV in this space, and I think that this is finally maturing, and I don't know where this particular science would be without CERM and CERM's investment. So I think this is, is looming as, as a very good space for CERM as we try to get results for the people of California. And then the last thing I'd like to say is that uh, I think tremendous credit goes to the patients who are going to enroll in this trial. You know, this is a phase one trial. This is a safety trial. So the people who are enrolling in the, into, into this trial are, um, are taking risk. And they're really doing this for the benefit of the community. This has been the way that the HIV community has worked now for three decades. Uh, engaging in trials really to benefit the larger community. And I think as we move into the clinical trial space, it's very important that we're aware uh, and conscious. And, and I personally am very grateful for the courage of patients to take these risks merely to benefit the larger community. So um, having said that, I'm going to go into the introduction of the uh, two folks from Calumune who are here to present on their project. So Lewis Breton has been in biotech for 20 years. He's the CEO, director, and co-founder of Calumune. <coughs> Prior to Calumune, Mr. Breton founded CellZ Direct, a primary cell producer and contract research firm launched in 1999 that was acquired by Life Technologies in 2008. Mr. Breton was a founding member of Integrated Commercialization Solutions, a $500 million subsidiary of Bergen Brunswick, which is now Amerisource Bergen, that focused on bringing late stage therapeutics and specialty medical devices to the market. In his previous consulting career, he provided commercialization support to Fortune 500 corporations as well as innovative startups. He is a board member of the Bioindustry Leadership Council and past board member of the Arizona Governor's Bioindustry Cluster. He's also a past board member of the University of Arizona Steel 
Children's Research Center, a 501c3 organization that researches causes and develops therapies for childhood diseases. Uh, Jeff Simmons, Dr. Simmons, began his career in academic research with an undergraduate and master's degree from the University of Sydney, so another Australian. We've been very blessed uh, with the uh, uh, contributions from, from Australia. He's later obtained his PhD from the Weissman, Weissman Institute and conducted his postdoctoral fellowship at UCSF with Michael Bishop and Howard Varmus. As an acad academician, he managed a successful research group at the Children's Medical Research Institute in Sydney from 1985 to 1992. While in this position, Dr. Simmons was awarded two prestigious senior and principal research fellowships through the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council. In 1992, he joined Johnson & Johnson Research in Sydney to lead their HIV and cancer programs and went on to drive their HIV gene therapy R&D program through preclinical development to two phase one and one phase two clinical trials, which, I, which actually was our uh, first spotlight on HIV back, I think, six years ago, David Baltimore, and then some of the uh, folks at UCLA presented on that ribozyme trial, uh, very interesting how the field has progressed. Uh, he received the esteemed Philip B. Kaufman Research Scientist Award for outstanding achievement in the field of research and development for this work. Dr. Simmons has been with Calamune since 2000, early 2009 and heads research and development. He's published over 100 research papers and holds several key pat patents in the area of HIV gene therapy. So uh, I welcome them to come up and present and I thank them for their work. Thank you, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jeff Sheehy, you were speaking about the patients and uh, I think it's safe to say that Jeff has done a heroic job tireless efforts for, for HIV. I also want to thank CIRM for, uh, for not only supporting our project, but, uh, but supporting the space. You're going to see today that we've come a long way in HIV gene medicine, gene therapy. Uh, I also want to, uh, to just say that we want to thank the citizens of California. We consider ourselves uh, responsible stewards of their of their money and, and recognize that this is a, a very important time it's also a very important project so as you can see our company is really focused on HIV uh, specifically gene therapy and in fact our project is really geared around that in order to really understand where we are today it's really important I think to take a step back look at the global format, look at how the disease has progressed. Uh, HIV is, is a massive pandemic. And, and unfortunately, when you look at data, it doesn't necessarily share with you all the, the horrific stories of the patients themselves, but it does give you a bit of, of a landscape of where things are today. So if you look at uh, the, the numbers that are very well known, the 34 million patients, um, here in the United States, we're at 1.2 million. Those are, again, fairly well-known numbers. But if you get to the less well-known numbers, you begin to see the difficulty with treating HIV. And that is, if you look at the patients well-controlled and adherent on therapy, it's only a little more than 10% of the overall population that have HIV. That's a pretty scary number, especially due to the fact that the world efforts have been spent on not just diagnosis, but also in increasing the amount of therapy worldwide. So in order to really understand this, you have to overlay it with the landscape over the course of the last decade. So if you look at the patients that are living with AIDS, it's increased, that is good news. Antiretroviral therapy has been doing a, a very good job of allowing patients to live with HIV versus die of AIDS. Um, the diagnostics have gone well in different regions of the world and they're becoming more available. So uh, patients, uh, there's more patients, almost double what it was a decade ago. But if you look at the bottom, the newly infected per year we're still at about 2.5 million. And a lot of those are children. And if you split it in half, it's almost 50-50 between women and men that are, attracting, that are contracting HIV. So there's further complication. Despite the fact that these medications have been incredibly useful, 
And I'm sure that you have seen some of the spotlights in the past that really went into some of the complications of the antiretroviral therapy. The good news is people are able to be on it for long periods of time, but the bad news is, is that it unfortunately has an effect on different parts of their system. Their bones, sometimes their heart, there's an accelerated aging, um, and it's not a cure. And they have found that if you take patients off of antiretroviral therapy, there were studies that were done that were uh, uh, historical studies relevant to uh, tracking patients that have gone on some level of holiday, you'll see that their HIV comes back um, and their viral loads will retract within a, 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 four, uh, a fairly uh, short period of time. So the other issue is, is that you have low patient adherence rate, even here in the United States. And, and the news was not great. It came out uh, even at the last international uh, AIDS forum where people were talking about uh, just how difficult it is to have people continue to stay on antiretroviral viral therapy. Sometimes it's, it's adverse events. Sometimes it's treatment fatigue. Um, but here in the US, it's difficult. If you look at the rest of the world, the number is actually worse. So no therapy provides long-term immunity. And if you look on the right-hand side of this screen, 32 billion is really being spent on that 10% of the population with HIV. It's a pretty significant number. So alternatives are really desperately needed. So b back in the late 80s, David Baltimore had an idea you know, it had been that gene medicine was going to be the future where you ended up working on defective genes, replacing them and the like. But, but he had the idea of something called intracellular immunization, where you'd be able to take a stem cell, treat it with something that would ultimately protect the cell itself. So instead of targeting the disease, you'd be targeting at boosting the immune system, a real significant uh, movement towards a different approach, not just to HIV, but potentially other diseases as well. The issue with this, though, is that this concept that David had was still at the early stages of the progression of this science. And so the field of gene therapy was still quite raw. Since that time period, there's been a lot of different advances uh, in technology that have really allowed for the field, the entire field, to, to grow and develop. If you look at those, it's really required that there are multidisciplinary advances for breakthroughs in any field to grow, in our field especially. So cell isolation techniques have advanced both for T cells and stem cells. The vector systems that you're all familiar with, that, that uh, you've been seeing different types of delivery mechanisms to get the payload of, of what you're looking to treat the disease with, have improved. In our particular case, we're working with a third generation system that has safety parameters. Understanding HIV and, and, and the concept of reservoirs and, and where HIV resides in the system and where it hangs out, that has also advanced. There are more uh, individual scientists that are working on that field. The other unique thing is that a number of different products, there were specifically two, but there are some in development, started looking at inhibiting HIV from the entry so if you could block HIV from getting into the system, and you'll see why this is so critical, that maybe you have an opportunity to decrease how it proliferates, how it grows, the increase of the viral load. Also, it's important to understand that there are different forms of HIV. It's not just a single tropic form. Even though CCR5, which is part of our particular story uh, we believe is one of the most critical elements. There's CXCR4, and people are starting to learn more about what that process looks like, entropic conversion and the like, and of course, stem cell science, just how many people are actually doing trials nowadays. It's over 2,500 trials for stem cell research that are in all phases of clinical trials. So 
HIV gene therapy has been around for a while, and as I had mentioned, it's still a work in progress. We feel, uh, I mean, truly, we, we are the culmination of decades of work, certainly for our founding members, David Baltimore, Irvin Chen, Inder Verma, the ones that have been in this space, uh, along with Dr. Simons, who will have a chance to speak here. They, they've spent a career really working on refinement understanding what the data was sharing so that you could move forward and take the next step into a clinical trial that had a better opportunity for optimization of really battling the disease. So there have been over 220 patients that have been treated with HIV gene therapy over the course of the last 20 years. If you really look at what has been achieved and what's been learned is we know that the stem cells and T cells actually can be successfully harvested, gene modified, and given back. Back. Uh, marking level, unfortunately, without any type of conditioning, is about 0.001% or 0.38%. What this means is you want to get those stem cells to go back into the bone and continue to repopulate with new T cells that ultimately become the warrior cells of the body to fight HIV. If you can't get enough of those cells in, there may not be enough selective pressure by HIV, which kills off the other cells, in order to have that be the therapy, the one-time therapy, versus having to do this multiple times. So we are hopeful, and you'll see why, that we can begin to move forward in increasing that number. We also have learned that monotherapy is likely not sufficient to really prevent resistance. Just like the cocktail therapy, HIV finds new ways of going around different therapeutic mechanisms. And so you really need to make sure that you have a multi-dimensional, multi-therapeutic approach. There are encouraging results about viral load and CD4 T cell counts. Sangamo has just recently uh, published some data, as well as Carl June, that's very exciting. There's also selective advantage that has been demonstrated back in 2005 through Padzikoff's work. And it's been shown over at City of Hope, uh, they are working primarily with HIV uh, uh, leukemia patients or lymphoma patients that, um, that myeloablation increases the level of engraftment. So there are hints along the way. And, and really, part of this process has been to learn what is going to work to be able to tweak it, manage it, and come at it with a new mechanism. So the Cal-1 therapy that we're taking forward that, uh, that CIRM is helping to support really has multiple uh, different uh, places that we have looked to impact uh, trying to head towards better efficacy uh, for HIV gene medicine. The first is that we've got a combination therapy. Uh, and we have found, at least in the early mouse and uh, uh, animal studies that we have conducted, including simian studies, that we're active against all tropic forms. Now, again, my studies simian studies are not human beings, so it's an important next step, but it's good indicators that we're on the right track. Also, it's mitigated against resistance, meaning that it continues to work even though there's different generations of the form of HIV. We're also looking to target two different cell types. We're looking at targeting the T cells, the cells that are actually uh, directly attacked by HIV to strengthen them, and those tend to be shorter lived, though there are some of those types of cells that live longer in the system, and there have been different groups that have shown that. But we're also going to be treating the hematopoietic stem cells, which are the CD4, CD34 positive stem cells, for long-term protection. And the idea there is, if you can actually protect those cells, the ones that are producing the T cells, you would have protection potentially for a much longer time period, potentially indefinitely for a patient. Again, this is the concept. Uh, we are now looking to, to, to put this into our very first safety trial. And then, of course, engineering resistance. What we're looking to have happen here is that there would be selective uh, expansion of the cells that we modify, uh, that we put in, where HIV, again, is that selective pressure. 
And then lastly, we're planning on using a level of conditioning which allows for space of these stem cells so that when the stem cells are reintroduced into the body, that they home to the, the marrow and continue to produce the T cells that are so important for protecting against this particular uh, uh, nasty disease. So the two active inhibitors that we are using, and you're probably very familiar with CCR5, which is a co-receptor on the surface of T cells that is used by HIV to get into the cell uh, and wreak havoc. Um, so we have something that decreases that co-receptor, and then we also have something that blocks the fusion. So if, if somehow HIV can attach, even if it can attach, we have a secondary mechanism called C46 that would block it from fusing to allow for the viral envelope ultimately to get in. We've consistently, again, in our preclinical models, seen a three and a half to four log inhibition. Um, this is, is quite good against what uh, tends to be the case with antiretroviral uh, medication. Um, and if you look at uh, the, the test that we've conducted, we wanted to make sure that, again, resistance was something that we could tackle. So we've tested it against CCR5, CXCR4, and dual tropic strains of virus, and it has, it has done well uh, in those areas as well. So why did we select this particular mechanism? Why is it so important to hone in on a mechanism like a co-receptor? Well, Nature has done a lot of wonders for HIV. Um, and for some patients, nature has actually provided a specific level of protection, complete protection, if they don't have um, this particular gene that creates the co-receptor. So 1% of Caucasians actually lack CCR5, and they're completely protected. Whereas about 10% have about half of the CCR5 they do get HIV, but they have a delay of the progression of disease by three to five years. So again, half of this CCR5 provides a delay. What, what Dr. Baltimore and scientists at Calimune have looked to do is decrease that number from a half to much, much lower percent. So in our, our previous studies, we've been able to get approximately a tenfold decrease in CCR5, which has translated to protection of those cells. So up until about 2006, people that had been looking at cell and gene therapy for HIV were incredibly skeptical whether it was even feasible to consider this path. And if you look at um, that time period, you can see that people were getting a bit more traction in regards to antiretroviral therapy, though the costs were continuing to go up. And they were hopeful uh, that the generics, when generics came uh, out, that, that they would be able to, to provide that to the rest of the world at a, a low enough cost and get that out. Unfortunately, you know, that effort, as you can see, it's, it's been very, very good. The progress has been good, but it has not really captured all of the patients. And, um, and so in 2006, there was something that provided tremendous hope for the entire community. And that was that a doctor ended up treating an HIV leukemia patient, um, Timothy Ray Brown, who you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, the doctor, Giro Hooter, on the right. Uh, the patient had HIV and leukemia, required a full bone marrow transplant. And because of that, he needed to have cells from a different patient. His doctor deciding that, um, that he might be able to do an experiment where he would provide uh, blood type matched uh, cells back to his, his patient, but also with that rare CCR5 negative uh, uh, constituency, when he ended up giving those cells back, he recognized that his patient uh, had no HIV detectable, and it's now six years later, and uh, the patient has no HIV and leukemia, and, um, and this was a big step forward, because despite the fact that it was somebody else's cells, despite the fact that it was an allogeneic transplant, it ended up having a result that showed that HIV in this particular circumstance, and it was just one patient, could potentially be uh, eradicated. 
They call it a functional cure, and I say potentially because HIV still may be there, but this patient has been off of all antiretroviral therapy for that time period. So it's very exciting, and back in 2006, this was at the cutting edge. Today, many are looking to repeat this exact experiment, but we're not looking to do this exact experiment because giving somebody, somebody else's cells could be extremely difficult to scale this to the, the type of, of world population that we're talking about. So in order to really talk about exactly what we're doing, that hopefully begins to take a path of moving towards what transpired with the Berlin patient is Dr. Jeff Simons. Jeff? What I'd like to talk about is the clinical trial that we're proposing, or we are actually doing. So this, this is a cartoon that I'm showing you of what actually happens. So the individual is a HIV-infected individual, and on the top, Part number one is apheresis. So this is a, a, a process where blood is taken from the individual and the mononuclear cell, the white, the white blood cell fraction is purified. So there's a small volume apheresis in which we purify one of the populations of cells that Lewis talked about, the CD4 T lymphocytes. And then those cells are isolated using uh, magnetic beads and they are uh, cultured. All of this work is in cell culture. Then the patient comes back for a second apheresis after they've, been, after they've taken a dose of GCSF, which causes the most immature cells, the stem cells, to come out of the bone marrow space into the peripheral blood, and they can then be harvested. And those cells are isolated again through a, a selection process, and those cells are put into culture. So we have two lots of cells in culture, the Cal1 vector that Lewis talked about as well with the two agents, the short hairpin RNA to CCR5, and the C46 fusion inhibitor is added. The cells are frozen, release testing is done to make sure the product is safe, and then both those cell types are in introduced into the individual to see if our theory is correct. That is, we can produce a population of cells within the individual that are protected from HIV and mimic the results seen in the, in the pr patient, Timothy Ray Brown, that Lewis talked about. So this process has begun. We are treating the um, cells of the first patient as we speak. We mentioned previously that we need to make space, and there is an agent called busulfan, which creates bone marrow space so that there is more room for the stem cells that have been transduced to expand and their progeny to expand to produce the population of cells that are protected from HIV. So where is the clinical trial up to? We received FDA clearance in October of last year. There are three cohorts, all of whom, all the individuals have decided to not take heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy for a period of time, for at least six weeks coming into the trial. There are three groups. One, who received the stem cells and T cells with no conditioning. The second cohort, who received stem cells and T cells with a low dose of conditioning, it's four milligrams per kilogram of busulfan. And then the third cohort, moderate conditioning with both cell types, eight milligrams per kilogram. The inclusion criteria, CD4 counts the lower limit. The, the CD4 count must be greater than or equal to 500 cells per microliter. And the viral load upper limit of 100,000, these are safety measures to make sure that the subjects who are entering the trial can see the trial through to its conclusion. So this is the design of the trial. It's the trial that is being conducted at the moment. This work is being done at UCSF, at the mission site and uh, staff are there processing cells. Um, uh, they have just finished processing the first patient's cells. They will be frozen, and then re after release testing, they'll be infused back to the same individual. So that's all we wanted to uh, say today. We wanted to describe the type of therapy that we are using. We wanted to explain the rationale, that is to produce a population of cells that are protected from HIV, different to taking tablets for life, and that is the current therapeutic regime, and there are side effects of those tablets that can be severe. That This is a different paradigm. We're putting cells into the patient, into the individual, to produce a population of cells over time that mediate protection from HIV. And in conclusion, I'd just like to say what we are looking for. We're looking for safety and feasibility in this trial. The level of cell engraftment, that is how many cells actually contribute, 
within the body and cell contribution over time. And then to acknowledge the various parts of this structure, the Calamune team members who are listed there on the left-hand side, the UCLA team members, um, who we collaborate with. We have done mouse modeling experiments with those collaborators and early preclinical experiments. The key contributors, David Baltimore, Irvin Chen, Inder Verma, Don Song An, and principal investigators for the two sites, one at UCLA, that's Dr. Ronald Mitsuyasu, and the other at Quest Clinical Research, <clears throat> that's Dr. Jay Lalazari. And as I mentioned, the, the actual cell processing is done at the UCSF uh, center. We'd like to acknowledge the support of CERM, without whom this work would not have really been possible. And thank you for allowing us to speak and be part of this spotlight today. Thank you. What do we do now? Thank you, Dr. Simmons. Any, anybody have any questions for either gentleman? Yep. Dr. Duliege? Yeah, first of all, congratulations, sincere congratulations to you, your team, Mr. Breton as well, for being, having done or doing this pioneer work, which is absolutely amazing and requires a lot of um, hope, future, and, uh, and dedication. Uh, two quick questions is, how large is the 12 and when will you expect to have the first readout, you know, roughly? The second is, can you tell us, if possible, a little bit more about your interactions with FDA and how do you see the next steps after that? The interaction with the FDA? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the size of the uh, trial, it's 12 um, individuals, four in each cohort, the cohort one, two, and three that I talked about. Mm -hmm. the, as to results, we are treating the first cohort now, and that will take place over the next few months. Then the major readout is at 12 weeks to, to see that we're getting uh, reconstitution in, in terms of safety and gene marking. Okay. In terms of interaction with the FDA, that's been a very nice and pleasant process, actually. They've been very supportive. There's been iterations backwards and forwards in terms of the trial design, the safety measures, and we've been very happy with the agency. And the 30-day the window was also very busy, but we succeeded in answering the questions. Would you like to comment further? I'd like to just say something, actually, about the, the regulatory body. Um, you know, our space is maturing, the, the gene therapy space as a whole, and uh, we, we dealt with CBER, and it was a, a really unique opportunity um, to see how, because we had multiple things, obviously, that are quite unique about our study, how best to address them. And we have believed as a company early and often is the best way to coordinate. Um, and they were quite responsive. So uh, we think that that's because of all the heroic predecessors in the field that have really laid the groundwork for us to, to move forward in this capacity. Dean Pomeroy. Um, I too would like to add my congratulations. Uh, and, and as an HIV physician, um, I, I'd like everyone to just sort of stop for a moment and remember that they were here when heard about this, this study at this moment in history, because I can think back to the first AZT trial, and I don't think at the, that time we understood the significance of that trial, and I want to make sure everyone understands the significance of what's being talked about here. I mean, I do remember three decades ago when this disease was inexorable, and if I could have imagined then the fact that three decades later I would be sitting here listening to um, the hope that is engendered by this concept. Um, I don't think I could have imagined that because we were too busy um, holding people's hands as they died. And, and so now what this is, and we don't know if this one will work, but, but we do know that it brings hope and it uses the power of all of those patients who acted up all of those years and demanded research investment, and it uses the power of science to try and find a better solution than we've had to date. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Senator Torres. First of all, I want to thank uh, Jeff Sheehy for his very gracious remarks and for his leadership uh, for all these years. And thank you for both of you doctors for the wonderful work that you are undertaking, which I think is going to be a, a testament to the confidence of the voters of California in creating this agency in the first place. 
It was in 1982 when I was chairman of the subcommittee, the Ways and Means Committee on Health and Welfare. And it was a very difficult time, yeah. very difficult time. We did have money, though, at the time. And so I was able to secure a $25 million grant uh, to people that were working on HIV, especially Dr. Marcus Kona uh, in San Francisco, who really did tremendous strides with uh, Carposi uh, sarcoma at that time. But it was very difficult to get the approval for that money. We were very lucky that we had some courageous legislators who at the time supported that effort. So for me as well, all these years later, it is so riveting and so inspiring to hear what you're doing. Congratulations. Thank you, and thank you, thank you for all your diligence over the years. Mr. Jules Garrett. <clears throat> so that now that you've been uh, appropriately thanked and uh, <laughs> applauded, I just have a question. So the approach that you're showing this is an autologous one. And the question is, is what is the opportunity to go from there to, uh, <clears throat> to a more general approach? Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to start, and then Dr. Simons, I'm sure, can add much more detail scientifically. And, and thank you, uh, Senator Torres. I, I, I have to say, though, I, I don't have a doctorate. Um, I'm more of a, a translator. I consider myself uh, between business and science. So um, for that, I'm not sure a doctorate is a, appropriate. Um, I, I believe that it's going to be important to begin the process of identifying efficacy before becoming more efficient. There are lots of different types of mechanisms to begin looking at ways to go, which where we're starting is obviously the, 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 the first world population. There are, there are uh, over 600 bone marrow transplant centers around the world that have facilities set up that, that could be the distribution path for this type of therapy. And, and that's an important factor, by the way. Um, anybody who's really considering this approach has to begin looking at how you're going to get this to a larger population. The other question is, is how else could you potentially move this beyond autologous cells? Well, th there are possibilities of doing that, um, uh, where it could even be an allogeneic uh, a, a, a therapy of sorts. And there are new technologies working in cord blood. There's a lot of people that are working with different types of mechanisms to push that process along, as is our internal group looking at ways to advance it. First step for us, though, is, and, and we appreciate the applause. T to be honest, the truth is, is getting here has been a, a major, major milestone for the company, but, but we're still early. And um, we want to make sure that we, we move forward with cautious optimism. I, I would just add to that I agree about the cord blood, that that's a, a possibility to make it less um, a, a, a patient specific. There's also means to automate the procedure to make it less of a cottage industry approach. So, and I agree with what Lewis said that first steps first, but we would aim to have it much more user friendly and um, automated. Any other comments? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.